Uh, welcome to this webinar uh, brought to you by SRM University, Delhi NCR, and Nature India. My name is Shubhra Biyadarshini, and I'm the chief editor of Nature India. Our guests today are the Australian veterinary surgeon and winner of the Nobel Prize in Physiology of Medicine 1996, Professor Peter Duherty, uh, Professor Vishwamohan Kotoj, former Director General of the Indian Council of Medical Research and President of JIPMA, an expert in TB and immunology. We have Professor Virendra Singh Chauhan, Executive Chairman of the National Assessment and Accreditation Council of the UGC, known for his work on the recombinant malaria vaccine and an expert in molecular biology and immunology. Thank you all very much for joining me today on this very timely chat. Uh, let's hear from the Chancellor of SRM University, Delhi NCR, and Chairman of the SRM Group, Sri Ravi Pachamutu. Uh, good morning to everyone. I welcome Dr. Professor Peter uh, and uh, Dr. Vishwa Mohan Kauch and Vinayinder Singh Chaugan. Chairman NAC, former director e, ICG, EB, and chairman UGC, and other all the panel members who are presented here in this uh, webinar. And I am very glad to see you in this situation. What uh, India is facing the problem? It's a very serious issue. The COVID is going on, and. Uh, I think this is the right panel and right place. You are all discussing about the immunology and virology, which is needed for the hour. Our people, we are standing in the fourth. India is standing in the fourth place for this COVID. The people in India requires your support and this drug discovery, or at least some suggestions how to control this epidemics in this bad scenario i i all i know you all, you all can deliver a good support to the country and the nation and if i want to say about srm srm is 50 year old institution which has got the right from kg to doctorates and research institutions and this has contributed a lot for research and that to all the campuses put together, we have four universities, almost 70,000 students are there. And this group has contributed a lot for research. We are interested in research. We will do anything to support the research in the way of technology or the infrastructure, anything it requires for the need of the hour. I think with these few words, Thank you, all the members who are presented here. And the webinar is going to start. In this webinar, there are a lot of inputs is going to come, which I think this will be useful for the country. Thank you, one and all. Thank you very much for your opening remarks. Uh, so COVID-19, as we all know, is testing the limits of science, healthcare, putting immense demands on politics, economies and societies. Uh, very little in our lives and very few countries have remained untouched by the pandemic as we know it. Uh, let me begin by opening today's discussion with you, Professor Duherty, on a more broad-based question that everyone is desperately seeking an answer to. When, if at all, in the foreseeable future, do you see a let up from the virus and where do you envisage that coming from? It's, uh, I, th I think the, uh, of course, we're all gra grappling with this question. So far as I can see, the only let up uh, can come apart from practicing social distancing and so forth, which we know can work to some extent, but is enormously expensive economically. Uh, the only uh, solution I can see is when uh, we get a vaccine and uh, that's moving very fast. Uh, the vaccines, as we all know, are moving faster than at any time in human history. I believe uh, with one of the vaccines, it took six weeks from 
first getting the sequence uh, to start uh, a preliminary phase one trial. So we are moving with incredible speed, but the problem we all know is to be sure that the vaccine is efficacious in humans and also equally important to be sure that it's safe. And so we can't bypass that and we can't make that any briefer. There's no way that our marvelous technology, our wonderful knowledge of molecular biology and immunology can move that along faster. And so, as I understand it, the earliest we're likely to see vaccines, if nothing goes wrong, uh, being rolled out in reasonable amounts is late this year or, or up till mid next year. So we're all waiting to see and and we all understand what's happening, I think. All right, um, that's fair. Uh, though we do have some repurposed drugs already coming in with very good uh, efficacy and uh, we all have been hearing the story of dexamethasone. So what do you have to say about that? Yes, well, of course, dexamethasone, a very old drug, uh, uh, everyone knows it. Uh, the doctors uh, uh, who are involved in critical care and in patient care in hospitals are, of course, extremely interested in these uh, results. I don't think we've yet seen a research paper, but we've seen the reports. And uh, that looks great. And that will be incorporated into care for people who are really, I think, getting to be quite ill, that um, people who are uh, suffering already these signs of anosmia, uh, of, uh, of oxygen lack hypoxia, hypoxia and also um, those who are getting into issues with the uh, possible cytokine storm effects. So it's very promising. And that's one of the things we've all been watching for, I think, is, is that care will get better because we'll refine it. And of course, there are very th many things in in a patient care, especially the very ill, where it's almost an experiment to try something. So dexamethasone is promising. Uh, we're waiting to hear more about anti-interleukin-6. Uh, will that be really block, blockade of interleukin-6? Will that help a large number of patients or only a percentage of patients? My suspicion is it may help a percentage. And then of course, there's the whole clotting story. And as people get better at handling that, I think that may be one of the main risk factors leading to acute heart attacks and strokes, of course. And so uh, now that people are more focused on anticoagulation and maybe even busting up clots with uh, kinases and so forth, then I think we may, uh, we may see uh, move forward there. So that's one, one part of the solution. If we can get to the stage where large numbers of people are not dying, then we can start to treat it as, as a normal infectious disease without all these extraordinary precautions. But at the moment, still very large numbers of people are dying, especially in the older age groups. Yeah, yeah. so um, let me come to uh, the question of zoonotics, which is at the core of this entire pandemic, and we've been grappling to really make sense of that too. As science goes, we still have not traced back clearly the origin of the virus, and the uncertainty has, of course, triggered many conspiracy theories that we know of. Uh, for many, tracing the virus may not really have much implication right now. Uh, there are bigger questions to ask, of course. But what exactly do we know about the virus's beginnings? And are there any solid lessons we must take away from the zoonotic origin of the virus? Yes, I, I think the... There are very obvious lessons, aren't there? And um, I, I know probably no more than anybody else. Uh, the virus uh, we first was detected in Wuhan. The initial story we heard that everybody heard really was that this was a bat coronavirus and that it had, uh, was being, there was a focus of infection around the wet market in Wuhan. Uh, the pangolin was mentioned as an intermediate and uh, it seems these coronaviruses have all come in through an intermediate. We have SARS-1, uh, which uh, seemed to come in through the Himalayan civet cat, which was being sold live in wet markets. Uh, then we had uh, the MERS virus, 2012, I think, uh, looks as though it's bats to camels to us. And now, of course, we have this one. I don't think the evidence implicating the pangolin has been so strong and we're not quite clear about the origins of the virus. 
except likely it emerged in China, likely in from November maybe last year, but I'm not sure we're certain about that. Uh, so far as dealing with the infection, apart from damping down conspiracy theories and blame games and so forth, and I think blame games are totally useless, and of course, conspiracy theories, you never get anywhere with any anyway because they have their own life and it's very hard to uh, deflect a conspiracy theory with evidence. Uh, all that happens is you get another conspiracy built on top of it. And you're then, if you present the evidence, you're then part of the conspiracy. So it's almost impossible. And I think we should forget about that as scientists, because I don't think we can do anything about it, quite frankly. And, uh, and, and it is the fact, I think, that the, the issue of where exactly it originated probably needs more work, I suspect, and, unless we're not getting some information with Ch from China that we, we could know. But I think it probably needs more work. Now, as we all understand, uh, these zoonotic um, infections or these infections, not, not so much zoonotic in the, in the normal sense of, of something we'll catch from an animal, but something that jumps into humans. Uh, I think these infections are all becoming more prevalent uh, as our population increases, as we move more into uh, forest land and people are, are interfacing much more with wild animal species. They're more prevalent as, um, as uh, 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 when we have things like a wet market type strategies, or a, as in Africa, you will have the bushmeat phenomenon, which probably led to the original incursion of the AIDS virus. And so um, unless we get those under control, we can expect them in the future. Now, the issues here are, are basically hum very human issues. They're related to things like population size and pressure on food supply, uh, which of course people will go to where there's food if there's food shortage. Uh, and, and they're also in, uh, related to very deeply embedded cultural practices. And as we all understand, it is extremely difficult to change embedded cultural practices in large numbers of human beings. So my, my perception that as scientists, as epidemiologists, we can re recommend that, for instance, the wet markets would be better if we were without them, but that's not really our decision. It's, in a, in, it's always the decision of political leaders and, and of a broader consensus in the community. So as scientists, I think we must do our utmost to be ready for them. Now, one thing we could have done to be much more ready for this pandemic would have been uh, to take the message from SARS and from MERS and, and put a lot more effort into developing broad spectrum anti anti-coronavirus drugs, because as we know from influenza, we have uh, perfectly good drugs. It's not as good a target as COVID because uh, influenza viruses grow very, very quickly and uh, are often pretty much uh, not much around by the time people get really sick. But the people I think who are getting really sick with this, there's virus around in the longer term. So antiviral drugs might be a big help. We could have gone ahead and develop class-specific antiviral drugs as we have for influenza. Those drugs, the neuromendidase inhibitors and so forth, work right across all the influenza viruses. So I think we, we started to do that with CEPI for vaccines, the Center for Epidemic Preparedness Initiative, which was developing um, the uh, um, um, candidate uh, platform technologies for vaccines. And that's a great initiative. But I think we need a CEPI for drugs. And, and, uh, and to cover all the potential virus threats, the, there are the coronaviruses. I always worry about noroviruses. They're so infectious. Uh, there's a norovirus in rabbits, which is highly lethal. Uh, mm. There's the paramyxoviruses, uh, the Hendra type viruses, the Nipah type viruses. There are various viruses out there we could pick as possible threats. And it's always the respiratory pathogens or gastrointestinal with the norovirus that we, we might uh, think are major risks. I think we could do that and we should do that. We should have a spectrum of antiviral drugs. We lucked out a bit with remdesivir. It looks as though it may be useful. And uh, I think it's probably being used quite a bit in the States. And I've wondered whether we've seen, as we've seen death rates uh, 
drop in the United States, whether some of this is due to remdesivir, but I've seen no evidence. So I think that's one thing we could do to be prepared much more quickly. Because, of course, if we can't make a vaccine for some reason, I think we can, but if we can't, uh, the way out of it is, is drugs. And uh, the, the HIV strategy where people, uh, HIV prep, where you take uh, Truvada, which is two of the standard antivirals for HIV, but you take that ahead of time if you're someone who's indulging in risky behavior. So that would be one way of, of, of if we didn't have a vaccine or if the vaccine doesn't work very well in the main target group, which is the elderly. Right. So yeah, the, so many things that we could have done when we uh, started preparing for earlier uh, outbreaks and pandemics, but we haven't really gotten there. So uh, let me let me just uh, ask you a couple more questions, and then we'll move to the uh, other panelists, of course. Uh, one of them is about uh, genetics. What's happening with the post genetics of people who survive the coronavirus? What are the various reasons they are able to overcome? the impact of the virus? I haven't seen much on this and um, I haven't really seen anything on it. And I'd be interested to know uh, if anyone has. Um, as I understand it, um, there's a bit of evidence that people with A blood group are at, uh, at higher risk, but I haven't seen a lot on the host genetics. My expectation is that that genomics will be done, but we won't know a lot of the answers to it and, until much later in the piece because uh, we've been doing a lot on, uh, of course, all the isolates we have in Australia. Australia, we've had just over 7,000 cases with a lot of those take, a number of those being returned travellers who've been quarantined in hotels under government supervision, or uh, there's been recently, we've had a number of cases just coming from blitz testing where we're picking up people just, just at random. But uh, so we've had a very large, low number of cases but we have, uh, we have sequenced very large numbers of viruses. So we have a lot on the viral genomics and uh, we can use that for contact tracing, uh, for tracing the lineage of particular uh, transmission cycles. But we don't, as far as I know, is, uh, have anything much on host genetics. So uh, I'd be very interested to see, uh, if I, to hear actually if anyone else has information on that. All right. Yeah, we know that the virus is uh, all set to become the most sequenced one in history, yes. for instance. And uh, of course, it's uh, also going to be a challenge of what all these sequences uh, mean, really, without the accompanying patient data uh, being submitted to GSED or all the global repositories. So that's a question mm -hmm. that many people are also asking. Let me come to another another question of antimicrobial resistance, which is close to uh, the hearts of many researchers in India, because we face the brunt of it, really. Uh, will there be an, an impact on AMR due to the prevalence of the coronavirus? Uh, we're talking about bacterial infections. Antimicrobial resistance. Yeah, uh, microbial, as distinct from antiviral. Yes, yes, I, I really don't know. Are you seeing any signal like that, that there is, uh, is any in fact effect on antimicrobial resistance? My understanding from the clinicians is that um, secondary bacterial infections, not a particularly prominent feature of COVID, uh, unlike flu, where of course we can get really big problems with secondary bacterial infections. The, uh, the suspicion has always been that, or the uh, much of the evidence really that the 1918-19 flu pandemic, a lot of the very high death rates were due to uh, secondary bacterial infection, which is one of the reasons that even though the death rates were so horrific then, I mean, we had somewhere between 50 to 100 million people die in a global population that's a third the size of it now. Um, but uh, and uh, so the thinking has always been that, well, if we got that back again, we would probably save a lot of people with broad spectrum antibiotic treatment. Um, but I don't know if anyone was going to see a signal of that sort. I expect you would see that in India. Uh, we've had so few cases, really, that, uh, that we can't really make much comment on it. All right. Um, um, is that an aspect of the virus that you think needs more looking into? 
my virologist colleagues are looking at everything, of course, particularly from the point of, of blocking replication and, uh, and, and basically developing antiviral drugs. So like everywhere, I suspect, we have a number of uh, antiviral drugs that are being screened uh, for various people at the moment. Uh, our, our institute is the closest Australia has to a CDC. Uh, we combine uh, the uh, diagnostic arms and the, and the basic science arms in a way that's pretty unusual in Australia. And, and we're a federated nation, so all our, uh, at, a, at, the, at, at this stage, uh, though we have oversight committees nationally, everything is on a state basis. I suspect that's similar in India, isn't it? Yeah, and so, um, so at, the, at the moment we're, uh, we, we are actually doing a lot of the drug screening. A, lo a lot of that's being done in Kanta Subarao's lab. Kanta is the head of the WHO Influenza Centre, one of the six worldwide uh, centres. And uh, of course, a very experienced virologist, immunologist who, who we recruited from NIH. Uh, also, Jason McKenzie and various other people are doing some of the screening using different types of systems, but CAT is using infectious virus. So uh, uh, we, we've picked up a couple of candidates, I think, that look interesting. And the question is to take them forward. And we haven't got them into lab animals yet. Uh, we have a bit of a problem. The only uh, lab animal we have uh, really available is the ferret, uh, apart from the transgenic mice. So we're working up a lot on the transgenic mice front, uh, both to getting the transgenics and, and then using transient transfection systems with the transgenics so we can express them in different places, particularly in knockout mice. And I suspect, I expect that sort of work's going on all over the place too. Unfortunately, we don't have hamsters in Australia, which are also a very convenient test animal. Yeah, so the ferrets have been uh, pretty useful in other influenza uh, diseases, so I think uh, that's something that everybody's going with. Um, I'll pick up a question now from the audience. And, uh, uh, you know, since we have limited time, uh, somebody is asking, and uh, it has been asked so many times, uh, but still merits questioning, is what makes the coronavirus, the new one, more infectious and contagious than its earlier cousins? Uh, yes, that's another very good question, of course. It, and the does, the, it may be the case that there is a, a mutant form of the virus that's more infectious. That's still being worked through, I think. But there is, a, a, there is one variant, I think, which is, was at low frequency early on in Europe and is now at high frequency. And I think that variant is here at a fairly high frequency, in Australia, at a fairly high frequency as well. So it could be there's one variant that's a bit more infectious. No, no information yet whether it's more virulent. I, I haven't, haven't seen anything on that. And of course, we're all watching very, very closely uh, for any, any change in virulence. Uh, the, what makes this virus so bad, I think, is that this very tight binding to ACE2 and uh, basically that... Um, it's this vascular component to this infection, which is unusual and I think particularly horrible because it does look as though uh, the virus, even though we're not picking up viremia, which is not that unusual, it looks as though the virus is getting into the circulation, being taken out very quickly by binding to ACE2, which is expressed on endothelium and all sorts of places. And, and, and we're getting infection in endothelium, heart, kidney and all the rest of it. So that's so different from influenza, which is basically a respiratory infection with the usual side effects of cytokine production and stuff. But this thing has a totally different component to it. So it's a particularly, I think a particularly horrible virus and it's the tightness of this binding to ACE2. Now there's nothing evolved about this. I mean, it's evolved in a bat, it hasn't evolved in us. It's just fortuitous that it's come across into us and it has this property. And so that's the problem with uh, zoonotic viruses or viruses that jump. You know, they've evolved to reach a reasonable, in the main, a reasonable accommodation with their, their original host. And when they jump, they can be particularly lethal and, uh, and, and basically uh, bad. So, so a lot of people, that, as I understand it from this, are dying basically of hypoxia, heart attacks due to clots. Um, strokes due to clots and so forth. The neurological component, I think, is still, it's very intriguing, not very well worked out. And of course, then there's the loss of smell that can happen right at the beginning that, um, 
uh, really is, uh, is very characteristic of this infection. I think that, you know, I mean, we normally often lose a sense of smell and taste in a virus infection, but not, ne not usually before we're getting a lot of mucus production and so forth. So I'm think my thinking about this virus is really the, the nose is an enormously portal, an important portal of entry for it. It doesn't have a neuraminidase to cut through mucus layers and all the rest of it. So I, I'm thinking the nose is, is very much the primary focus and it goes from there. Um, speculating about the pathogenesis of it is very, very interesting, but uh, of course we don't have an animal model to take it apart, um, apart from the ACE2 transgenics, which of course that then the pathogenesis depends on where you express the ACE2. Right. Uh, let me bring in, since we're talking about cytokine storms and the like, um, bring, let me bring in uh, Professor Chauhan here. Uh, and I'm hoping, uh, Professor Doherty, you can stay on with us for a bit longer. Uh, Love than, to, thank you. Than, than the half an hour. Uh, I, but, I will go off sometime and I'll say goodbye, but I will stay on. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, so, Professor Chauhan, uh, do we know of any effective medicines uh, to control the cytokine storms which rampage through the bloodstream of COVID-19 patients. So we, we have some fascinating research that has come in that says inflammatory immune, immune response can cause T cells to become depleted, affecting patient outcomes and leaving them prone to secondary infections. The drug, the steroid that Peter alluded to uh, is supposed to take care of cytokine storms. And when cytokine storm happens in every patient or not, or how prevalent this is, we don't, we don't really know. We know that some, some patients go in acute, severe cytokine storm. What exactly causes it, I think, still may be speculation. A lot of immunological speculations can be done. But I think seeing this very easily available, widespread use uh, steroid which is available i think opens the door for many other such therapy to be looked into and i just just add on to what peter had said to an earlier question in fact very early on when the <clears throat> sequence was uh, made available in january uh, of the of the virus i think within three four weeks uh, all what you could do in computer the the protein-protein interaction of all viral protein with the human protein. I think this is all done. There's a very large number of people involved, more than 100 scientists involved in the way that we are talking now. And they shortlisted about 70 drugs at that time, different kinds. They're, they're just molecules, not drugs. They're the all kinds of molecules, some already available, some not. So that was done as early as in end February. There were a lot of uh, usage of many possible drugs in any location. And finally, WHO got, got hold of it. And at least the five leading, uh, I suspect as it were, candidates have gone on to a very major solidarity trial, results of which are beginning to come now. So you're going to see interferon, possibility of using interferon, possibility of using multiple uh, anti-HIV kind of drug drugs that were discovered against possibly against Ebola. So two of these drugs are already beginning to be in the use. So I think this will, this will expand. But whether you will have a bullet directly stopping corona from or as a disease, I, uh, I think we just have to wait and see. Finally, just finding a new drug molecule against a virus which we know so little of, I think that's, uh, that's a hugely long process. So we might have to fall back on what we already have FDA approved. But things are beginning to look up. I think it's not all very bad. Great. Um, I have a feedback uh, for Professor Duherty from Narinder Mehra. Uh, just to let you know that the HLA community the world over uh, has made a consortium to study host genetics looking at HLA, KIR, and MICA, MICB molecules. So that's, uh, that's, that's good information coming our way. Uh, okay, so, uh, so since we are also talking about um, infectivity, uh, Professor Katoch is with us and, uh, and we, all, we all want to see a silver lining somewhere. Uh, uh, let me ask you, Professor Katoch, 
incidence of tb go down in india due to the practice of wearing masks and social distancing see the transmission of actually not only the tb all respiratory infections will go down i think this is something good the pandemic has brought to all of us and uh, i'm seeing that a major change in the people's habits and as was the duharty said in the beginning the habits are difficult to change but we have seen in india they can change so bharat is an example so i think if over a period of time because this pandemic is going to last for a couple of time couple of years so if the people really change their habits all respiratory infections will go down you know including tb yes the transmission will go down yes okay and uh, there's a question on recovery rates what according to you is the minimal recovery needed to halt the growth of new infections does high recovery affect virus virulence for anybody on the panel to take on maybe professor doherty you want to come in uh, are you talking about reproductive yeah. rate or i think Oh, I I think mainly in terms of reproductive rate which means that if you do have any infection out there in your community it can ramp up very quickly when you change behavior and we're worried about that at the moment we we we're just coming out of lockdown but we still know we have some virus in the community at low levels and the question is whether we can control this with um with 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 uh, contact tracing and checking for spot fires Uh, did lockdown allowed us to build up our testing capacity massively we had to disseminate it out into various labs get it validated and all the rest of it and also an, a, expand our hospital capacity with respect to um recovery in the sense of uh excreting infectious virus i i think that um uh sometimes the uh there was a lot of perception early on that there might be reinfection because the pcr test is so uh sensitive and we're picking up a lot of viral genome but not necessarily infectious virus so i think the perception here is that people who uh, who are not going to be require hospitalization or not going to get really sick from time of symptoms that uh, the virus will certainly be not uh, they will not be infecting people after 10 to 14 days uh, i expect that's a general perception i'd i'd be curious to know what your impression is because you've seen so many more cases in india Uh, how late do you think people can be infectious clearly very sick people can be infectious in icu uh, because uh, so many medical professionals have been have been uh, infected with this professor chohan i don't think we have enough data to answer your question with certainty um, uh-huh. it, in addition to that many so many other things about virus that we actually do not know we must always respect this virus a new virus an extremely painful one for example mm. we don't even know whether if you are exposed or no exposure or test positive and do develop antibody what should be the level of quality of antibody that will protect you from reinfection as it were i think these questions as you ask them right now will be answered in time when lot more data will be collected at this stage i, 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 I agree with you sir Yes we we've known about influenza for so long but we still have questions like that about influenza even and uh, and the question of low serum antibody levels and how well that correlates with protection particularly in older people i think is a very substantial one right uh also for professor katoch i i should come back to him we have these reports uh, about the relapse of covid infection um does this mean that the coronavirus goes into a latent phase like tb or are these cases of reinfection and uh, shubhra ji this is very difficult to prove you know because the studies have not been done see the until unless you do the molecular epidemiology and uh, you prove the point there is a same same strain or is a new strain how many strains are also circulating in coronavirus that's also itself is a question at the moment really we have not done work to prove a point but but it can, it it relapse can happen actually that does happen they say it, it, it you can't say it won't happen but it, the rate, the chances are very low actually there's a by and large you know is a all or none phenomena you go either way yes yes i know uh, there's a very interesting question and i don't know if you all are equipped to answer it but i'll still ask it because it's occupying the minds of 
many people in this country, it's about homeopathic medicines. Uh, can you please tell me more about the homeopathic medicines like arsenic album 300, which many people are using, thinking it would give them protection against uh, the coronavirus? Studied silence from me. Yes. <laughs> I, I think okay. I would avoid heavy metals, basically. Right. <laughs> I tend not to so, be good for you. <laughs> if they work, so good luck if they work, bad luck if they don't. Uh, we got the answer. I think we, we got the answer, even in the silence. Uh, so, um, okay, let me, let me then get ahead to the next question about uh, BCG, again, done and dusted. But uh, uh, though we know by now what it does and doesn't, uh, Professor Katoch, would you want to come in and say, does the BCG vaccine provide any protection against COVID-19? Actually, Shubhraji, I would like to respond to the first question on the homeopathy. I, I'm not, I, I will not either say either reject it or accept it. See, they, they, they must generate data and publish it. See, there's a good data they can generate. And Ayush, the Ministry of Ayush in India is doing that, actually. So all, all councils are doing, including the homeopathy, they are working on it. So I will not really close the chapter on that front. Now, coming to the BCG, as in the BCG is known as a potentially a good immunomodulator. See, there's the theoretical basis that it works against the viral, viral infections also in vitro. And uh, maybe in, in the human populations too. But to link that you know the TB incidence, then the, everything is inversely related to Corona, etc., etc. is you know, very is very speculative. I tell you, they're not backed by the actual data of today, or the real people who are suffering. That data should be based on that, not on the total cohorts. So BCG is a BCG, and that way even a microbitrim W, the which Professor Talwar has invented, I think, MAP also. These as a immunomodulator have a potential role. But then that potential role should be investigated. BCG should be investigated in the actual populations at the moment who got vaccination, what happened to them. And also new introductions of the BCG or recombinant BCG, but the MIP also the same way. I think so that way, microbiotical vaccines give a non-specific immunity against many things, against cancers, viruses, so many things. So they have a potential chance. So I think to me, that's the promising statement, but that needs to be properly investigated epidemiologically and also by interventions. Yes, of course. Evidence is king. Um, Professor Talwar, I think since we have you here uh, and it would be <laughs> so a lot if we, if we uh, don't speak to you about MW and what do you see as its uh, future? We are currently having clinical trials um, uh, for MW. Uh, for COVID-19. So uh, can you tell us a little bit about what's going on there? With great pleasure. First of all, let me tell you that I never expected that this vaccine which we originally made for leprosy is highly effective against tuberculosis. And tuberculosis, which is drugs resistant or, you know, all, all types you know, they say that there have been very encouraging reports on that. And what is more is that it is effective against anogenital warts. It's effective against several cancers. So the way I interpret it is that it's a invigorator of immune response, which means that the body resists. And let me also share with you that there is a trial going on by the CSIR Council of Scientific Industrial Research, where they're using my vaccine, MW. MW was the coded word when we were working on this, but now its sequence is known, and therefore it is called Mycobacterium indicus pranai MIP, because uh, its sequence is known, but still I, both are the same. Now you see this particular vaccine is already in trials against corona. And what I learned, at least from PGI and some centers, is that the results are very encouraging in terms of therapy, because that is a proof of what happens. 
So for protection, you need a much longer time to, to draw conclusions. But therapeutic ability of MW or MIP to counteract corona or to induce the body to throw away out her corona is very encouraging. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, can we also uh, understand a little bit about uh, nutrition supplements and vitamins against uh, in the fight against COVID-19? We have a lot of questions coming in for that as well. Professor Chauhan, would you want to take that? I think it would be risky to say yes or no, because as uh, the Professor Katoj said, if you say, unless you do a careful control study, I, as a scientist, I would thought sort of the vitamin C, vitamin D, the B complex, which may be useful, have been speculated, like so many other things, because of virus being what it was and how suddenly it came. I think everything people uh, posted, and especially social media. And I would hesitate to say this works or that doesn't work until a, a, a quality controlled trials are done. Until that time, as a scientist, I would say nothing is proven. Vitamins, you could argue they don't hurt you. If you took vitamin C, it's a little bit extra, might protect you from not only this or that. So I took vis-a-vis -vis COVID, I, I think you have to do the trials and the trials work out. Then of course you, the government itself would say, or the ICMR would say, go ahead and take this. I, I would not like to say okay. anything that has not been tested properly, scientifically is, is going to remain in the, in the word of speculation. That's fair. Um, what we uh, understand right now is, uh, Professor Katoj, if you want to come in and speak about the role of ICMR, a lot of questions have been uh, asked of the role of ICMR in trying to figure out which are the best medicines, which, are, which is the best protocol for India to um, adopt and uh, embrace. Uh, as, as a former Director General, would you want to come in and say, uh, you know, give us your views about what's going on? Shubhraji, I, I think as a former DG, I should not say anything. But uh, what, I, what I'll say on the whole, you know, I'm, I'm very pleased with the efforts being made by the current leadership and uh, in a way they have galvanized action, created bigger coalitions. So I think um, on the, um, what I, I'm very pleased with the way the ICMR is fulfilling its role. That's it. But uh, I won't com comment on each and every point because I, I don't have a data to talk on that. But I'm, I'm very pleased with the, the total evolution, the current, how they galvanize action collected opinion, everybody. So I think they are, they are fulfilling their role very well. That's I'll say. I'm very happy with that. Okay. Uh, there are some questions coming in about the um, peak of the coronavirus. When do we expect that to happen? Um, uh, Professor Doherty, if you want to come in and talk about the uh, entire global situation and uh, maybe our panelists from India can talk about the Indian situation. When do we expect the peak and what's going to happen? Uh, is it going to be a, a, a peak and then a table and then going down the curve? How long are we expecting to be in this? I, I think that that's one of the great unknowns. And uh, I think the statement that this is a pandemic that's running for at least a couple of years is pretty accurate. If you look at the numbers of people infected around the world, you'll realize that even in countries that have been severely affected, except in some particular areas, uh, the majority of the population is still susceptible. So it would depend on how much you, uh, you practice the, uh, various uh, social distancing and so forth, which as we realize is economically impossible uh, for many places. So. It, it, there is no sort of peak in a sense. I, I've been looking at the data on whether there's any, uh, any seasonal effect. I, I can't see anything in the way of a seasonal effect that's very significant. There may be a bit there, but nothing like we're used to with colds and flu and with influenza, say, in the Northern Hemisphere. So I don't see that either. I, I, I think the, the illusion that we're past the peak 
as we hear some particular politicians say, is, is kind of not based in any reality that most of us would be in contact with. And so uh, I don't see peaking. I mean, we think if it's got an R naught of 2.5, that you need at least 60% of people infected before you see herd immunity. If it's higher than that, of course, that number goes up. I don't think uh, anywhere much is at 60% but maybe you have a different perception from India. No, there's no different perception. I think Peter is absolutely right. If you actually talk about scientifically obtained herd immunity, you need to expose very large number of population. And I think that is really uh, an unacceptable option as it appears, that kill yes. with no drug, with no vaccine. Uh, so, and then you, uh, yeah, this is the two tensions that were on one side, you have to stay indoors as much as possible, do social distancing, etc. On the other, you wish for a large number of people getting exposed that have herd immunity. So we are actually having this webinar at a time of extremely uncomfortable, unclear uh, situation. Scientifically also, we don't have an easily available model, so you can't push screening of vaccines, etc. So I think there are a lot of questions will remain question for quite some time to come. Europe is beginning to open, but you would hear already in China, there is another surge of infection. I think we'll just go through uh, very uh, difficult times in different countries, different location, depending on different population, different uh, levels of infrastructure to deal with this. And you would probably have this three, four months from now, you will have better sense of where the epicenters have moved to, where more infections have happened, how people have handled, how countries have responded. I don't think there's any cohesive, simple answer when, when it will peak, where it will peak. I don't think we, worldwide, we haven't seen a peak. That's the sense I have. I, I, I think that's right. And, and the other thing that's happening is that some countries that seem to be relatively spared were suddenly seeing a ramp up in cases. And whether that was due to inadequate reporting or testing, I'm not sure, but, but there's an asynchronicity in this. Not every country is coming in at the same time. That's how we, we ducked it to some extent in Australia because we just didn't have the background infection rates that they had in Europe and in the United States. Our, our prime minister and policy makers made the right decision and shut down. But I think we were very lucky. We just came in late. And so, uh, for instance, we, we also take some care of the small Pacific Island nations. Some of those countries have had no cases so far that we know of. And uh, they have reasonably good medical systems. So I think that's right. But I think uh, if you're looking at, at what's happening, I think watching what's happening in Africa, we're seeing some countries come in much more strongly. You know, when I talked for years about the 1918-19 pandemic, I always had this sense that I was saying 50 to 100 million people died. Well, you know, that's a big difference. And I wondered, we all sort of thought, well, maybe the, particularly the old colonial administrations didn't report so well from their their various uh, subject states and so forth. But, but now I can see what's happening with this one. I wonder whether the figures will be any better, quite frankly, because some countries are maybe not being as straightforward as they might be. So it'll be very interesting if we're still around in two or three years time to actually look at this and, and, uh, and, and do a forensic analysis on what happened. Right. Um, with this pandemic, we have also seen the rise of another parallel pandemic, which is the misinformation epidemic, where, which of course has uh, been uh, at the center of a lot of our debates and discussions lately about the misinfodemic that we have seen rising. Uh, your thoughts on how scientists should rise up to the occasion and uh, sort of try and scotch this wave of misinformation what is the role of the community? Uh, how can we all come together and really uh, put up a front that doesn't allow myths and uh, misinformation to percolate? I'll come back before I, I think that's an enormously important question, but an extremely difficult one. As we all know from the experience in Western countries with the anti-vaccination movement, 
simply putting good information out there, providing the evidence and so forth doesn't work. I mean, we, we've found that over and over. You, uh, if we have celebrities, for instance, who are often people who are very notable for their, and people love them for their performance on, on various media formats, uh, probably Bollywood in your case, um, then um, uh, they can speak with great authority without knowing anything at all. And, and the problem with such people is they can be perfectly nice people, but they don't know they don't know anything at all because they're really rather poorly educated. So education doesn't solve the problem. I've, I've written books on this. I wrote a book called The Knowledge Wars, oh. where I, I wrote it for the broader audience and I tried to point out this is where you can go to get information. This is how you can recognize a phony. I mean, we have some scientists who are rogues. We had scientists who were telling the South African president, including one member of the National Academy of Science, that the AIDS problem is not caused by HIV. As a, as a result, hundreds of thousands of people died in South Africa who need not have died uh, because this guy uh, had his ego invested in some ridiculous bit position. So, so scientists can, can be quite bad too. So it, it is an extremely difficult problem and it, I, it comes back not to people like us, but I think to the psychologists and psychiatrists. Actually, the, you see the misinformation in this social media activism days is, is, is very much there actually, and much more faster. But at the same time, the countering the misinformation to webinars, to the, the mass media, that's again possible. So I think more and more, actually, though, as Professor Doherty said, education, knowledge cannot totally wash off the, the, the side effects. But, uh, but, but actually, you can minimize. Certainly, you can minimize. There's a, so there's a, I see that today we are so much dependent upon these discussions, and they're going about three to four times more than they were possible a year before. So I think it's, it's a changed way of working. And, you know, these, this is there right up to the villages in India. Actually, the, the schools in the villages, are they are teaching through the webinars. They're teaching through the, this media. So to, to block the, change the perceptions. Of technology and availability of the way we talk to or have communicate with very large number of people, not only in your city, in your country, but across nations, the misinformation spread is an inevitable consequences of the technology spread. You can't just fish it away. There are sites, there are places where good quality scientific information is available. So it's not as if this information is not available. People are advertising it. People are giving out this information free. Agencies are supplying good quality information. But our attention of domain at an individual level, educated or uneducated, let's say school past and so on, you really get attracted to what you inherently want to believe. It's a more a question of psychology and philosophy. You want to believe something which is easily digestible. For example, I say X, if I do, if I do this, this will be uh, treated as I give one, two anecdotal uh, 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 on, on television, uh, some channel shows, look, this has happened. I think that tends to spread so quick, so very quickly. This is, I think psychologists and others will have to really look into this, that how come misinformation spreads faster than a quality scientific inf information? It's not that the scientific information is not available. Of course, scientists would say, look, we, at this stage, we do not know because we do not know enough. And I think that's the that's the duty of a scientist to say, we don't know this. And as much as we know is available on the net, it's, it's, if we follow. But the misinformation sometimes is very enticing, whether it's this kind or that kind, scientific or non-scientific. So I think this, this behavior of how the misinformation spread itself offers itself to deep research, how it happens that misinformation spreads faster than good quality information. Of course, we can see what Katoch is saying, we should go webinars and go door to door. But there's so much in misinformation about, mis about immunization. Both Katoch and I have fought all the time for this, but it's available. I mean, there those who want to believe it, believe it very happily. So I think it's a, this also social behavior, social scientists must get involved in, 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 in these issues to my mind. 
Yeah, sure. So yeah, one thing that we have, we all have as science communicators at some point of time have also seen is the fact that uh, you mentioned about uh, misinformation being enticing and how to counter that with information becoming as enticing as, as misinformation. You know, if, are, if you are to cut uh, an enticing bit of misinformation uh, with an equally enticing bit of information, that probably would work both ways. So my question to you is, I feel, see, the government is saying either lockdown or open. But I personally feel once you lock down, the house is getting loaded. Once you open the office and schools and colleges are getting loaded. The people are getting together in a public gathering. Why can't we uh, suggest to the government or the schools or the colleges that it can be open to 24 hours? All the shops, more uh, transportation, everything, if it is 24 hours, if you have 100 crores of people, it will be on rotation means then there will not be full well, population strength will not be at one place because somebody will be at the office, somebody will be at school, somebody will shop and on the roads. So now I am seeing either the government is saying that either do lockdown. Today, for example, Chennai is full lockdown. Now everybody is at home. One, what they say, from 6 to 2 the school shops are open. The people start going out. And I personally right. feel... Well, yeah, as I understand, the question is about uh, having a staggered lockdown and easing out of restrictions uh, okay. and not a complete lockdown and a complete opening up. Would okay. you panelists want to come in and uh, uh, answer that question? Uh, I mean, you have to balance. Uh, it's very easy to suggest this or that. But those who have to take care of policy making decision, they have an extremely tough time. If they were an easy solution, you would have seen them now. I think lock, complete lockdowns are very necessary when you didn't have even ways and means to deal with the virus. So I think the complete lockdown, for example, in, in India, to, to my mind, was absolutely spot on at the time when it was done. But now you say, oh, but you're all hidden inside your houses and how will you come out and open it 24 hours? I think that's not what anybody is saying or anybody is doing. I think you be cautious now. You know the enemy is out there. You know that you don't have a drug, you don't have a vaccine, but you know if everybody would mass diligently, and I was very surprised to see, not very happily surprised to see Delhi, a city of uh, 24, 23, 24 million people. So to suggest that at a given time, if you open 24 hours, there will not be concentrations. I don't think it happens. It's a 24, 3 million people is a very large uh, number of people. So I think then the social behaviors, the, I think society has a responsibility. Policymakers have a responsibility for us, but a, but a society has a responsibility. That what you are told, you do that. If you're about 65, you're more susceptible, be huh? careful. Schools, if schools, large gathering is done, then there will be problems. And so, this is a wait and watch. You have to open a little bit, watch. If you have to lock down again, lock down again. I, I don't think there is any easy way out. And uh, I think ICMR, policy makers, all are doing their best. And as far as from where I see, uh, if we have to take those decisions, I think absolutely correct decisions are taken. If X city is opened up after lockdown and suddenly cases go up, and your hospitals can't deal with very large number of patients, what would you do if you have to take a decision? What you have to do and you and I will have to do is again, wait and watch, then relax it as much as you can. If it's an easy solution, it would have been there by now in front of every one of us. There aren't any easy solutions. So there's Sweden on one side, England is going to open shops, already has opened. But I dare say if everything goes up, I think they'll again take decisions. So I think this will be a long haul. There will not be this or that. I think it'll be wait and watch. What is more successful than the other will be implemented. That you can you you will be able to criticize any decision or every decision that is taken at the hindsight. But you have to take decision for now and for future. That will only happen as more more and more you learn. Suppose tomorrow you do have a vaccine then your whole 
opening up will will alter and so on so forth thank, thank you, you very much thank you.